Welcome to the inaugural Howard R. Driggs Memorial Lecture. I'm John I, the Interim Dean of Library Services at SUU, and I'd like to thank everyone for coming this evening. I would also like to welcome our audience viewing this on the World Wide Web. The Share Library is pleased to host this lecture, honoring the legacy of Howard R. Driggs. But first, I'd like to take a few minutes to announce the creation of the Friends of the Gerald R. Share Library Advisory Board. This board will help set policies and procedures for the general membership and the Friends of the Library to support new services and improvements. I would like to take a brief moment to acknowledge our advisory board members. When I announce your name, please stand. Doug Bonzo. I don't think he was able to make it. Camille Bradford. Camille is backstage. Helen Engelhart, Diana Graff, Ann Levitt, thank you, Barbara Matheson, Clayton Petty uh, was not able to make it. Um, Gerald Sherritt, and Lorraine Warren. Thank you all for agreeing to serve. And finally, I'd like to thank Camille Bradford and the Driggs Lecture Advisory Committee, Pre uh, President Benson and Mike Levitt, and, anyone, and everyone else who helped to make this lecture possible. Um, now, please welcome President Michael T. Benson. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to be here, especially considering that this is the second to last day of the state legislature. And uh, we're uh, very happy to report that. Uh, Senate Bill 201 was passed out of the House successfully this morning, which authorized the funding of our new science building. So in the midst of some bad news, uh, a bit of very good news. So uh, again, I'm so pleased to be here, and I welcome all of you uh, to this inaugural Howard R. Driggs Lecture. I f when I first came to SUU, I had a chance to read a bit about Howard R. Uh, Driggs, and about this time last year, we had the dedication in the Howard R. Driggs room over in the Sherrod Library. And I really came to appreciate what a Renaissance man Dr. Driggs was. He helped launch, of course, the BNS in 1897 as one of the fabulous four, as we call them, uh, one of the four original members of the faculty. He became a very well-known professor of English and a historian of the American West. As it turns out, his uh, family roots are deep here. His son Wayne would eventually serve as the director of the BAC. We are thrilled to have the Driggs room over in our library. And I remember becoming acquainted with his uh, stepdaughter, Camille Bradford, whom I have the pleasure of introducing this evening to all of you, and how impressed I was with her and her memories of her father, and how uh, she regaled all of us with stories of his telling her about the American West and how important it was to chronicle this history and make it available uh, to other subsequent generations. Uh, last year I had a chance uh, during the dedication of that room to read a quote that I'd like to share again tonight. Uh, it's from William F. Buckley who passed away recently. But he wrote in a book called Gratitude, Reflections on What We Owe to Our Country. He wrote this uh, statement. 
to fail to experience gratitude when walking through the corridors of the Metropolitan Museum, when listening to the music of Bach or Beethoven, is to fail to recognize how much we have received from the great wellsprings of human talent and concern that gave us Shakespeare, Abraham Lincoln, Mark Twain, our parents, and our friends. We need a rebirth of gratitude for those who have cared for us, living and mostly dead. The high moments of our way of life are their gifts to us. We must remember them in our thoughts and in our prayers and in our deeds. In point of fact, it's thanks to people like Howard R. Driggs that this history is recorded and that we can reflect on how fortunate we are to have this history. I would especially like to thank uh, Camille for her work with her family foundation in bequeathing to the university the, the Driggs papers, the Driggs collection, uh, which is a vast collection. I see Ann Levitt here on the front row. She knows exactly what I'm talking about. We are now the repository. The library is of a vast collection from this family's collection. And uh, I thank Camille for her leadership. I'd just like to say a bit about uh, Camille and introduce her to you this evening. She's been very, very supportive of the university, as I said. Uh, she's the founder of the Howard R. Driggs Memorial Foundation, whose mission it is to preserve and perpetuate Driggs' ideals and legacy in education in Western American history. She's a trained attorney, having been educated at the University of Pennsylvania and the Widener University School of Law. And to just tell you uh, that she's still committed to her family's heritage and to this history, uh, next year, the Pony Express will be celebrating its 150th anniversary of the first ride, and Camille will present a lecture titled, The Pony Express Diamond Jubilee, revisiting the excitement of the 1935 rerun at a commemoration at, no, uh, at uh, the National Postal Museum in Washington, D.C. So it is uh, truly fitting that she's following in her, in her father's footsteps and that we have her here this evening to introduce uh, our speaker for the first inaugural uh, Howard R. Griggs Lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Camille Bradford. Thank you, President Benson. I certainly appreciate your kind comments and your kind comments about my stepfather and how much he meant to me. Uh, I'm certainly very honored to be here for Founders Day. Um, I know how much this institution meant to my stepfather. Uh, his career began here, and um, this photograph was taken of him the year, the year he began teaching here, 1897, uh, when he had just graduated from the University of Utah and came here as uh, one of the founders of the university. Um, and over the years, uh, I, I know, I mean, I, I can't say strongly enough how much the school meant to him. Uh, as President uh, Benson noted, uh, late in later years, um, his older son Wayne, my stepbrother, um, was the director here. And the ongoing relationship that my stepfather had with this institution over the years meant a tremendous amount. And also to my mother, um, who died last year at age 98. Um, ten years ago, she came here for Founders Day when a painting uh, was unveiled of my stepfather in the Great Hall. And I know how much that event meant to my mother and uh, the warmth and um, friendship that the university had expressed to her. Um, I also appreciate very much what the university has done to preserve um, my stepfather's legacy for future generations in the Special Collections Library. Um, they have just done a wonderful job. and. Um, it's something that I uh, know means a great deal to members of uh, our family, some of whom are here tonight, some of whom are watching the webcast. Um, and uh, the, the, the care and attention that's gone into, it, into the preservation of this collection is just um, very gratifying to all of us. Throughout my stepfather's career as an educator and historian, he touched many lives in many different ways and inspired many people. Uh, some of the common elements of um, his ideals were a strong belief in just doing good for society, leaving it a better place than he found it, and most importantly, inspiring others to do likewise. Um, as an educator, he um, taught many future teachers uh, over the years, both in Utah and later at New York University, where he was the chairman of the English department in the School of Education. As a historian, 
He inspired people to appreciate the importance of our leg legacy from our ancestors and to preserve that legacy for future generations. And one of the goals of um, this lecture series, in my mind, has been to uh, create a forum for presentation of um, speakers whose ideals and achievements would inspire others, as my stepfather um, did throughout his life. And I'm deeply honored and gratified that Governor Levitt has uh, agreed very graciously to deliver the first Howard R. Driggs uh, Memorial Lecture. Governor Levitt has expressed very similar ideals in his public service. Um, first, to leave things a better place than he found them. Secondly, to plant seeds for the next generation and to give it his all. And I know that if my stepfather were alive today, he would feel he was a kindred spirit because these are very similar ideals that um, motivated him throughout his career. Governor Levitt is a native of Cedar City, graduate of Southern Utah University. Prior to entering public service, he had a very successful business career and was also a member of the Board of Regents of Utah, which oversees the state colleges and universities. In 1992, he was elected the 14th governor of Utah and was reelected twice. Um, in 2003, when he was appointed by President Bush to be the um, administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, he had been the longest uh, serving governor in the country at that time. Uh, in 2005, President Bush appointed him to be the Secretary of Health and Human Services, where he had a very distinguished uh, record um, until um, just recently when he returned to Utah. The Department of Health and Human Services, very significantly, is the largest civilian department of the government with over 66,000 employees and a budget that accounted for over a quarter of um, federal dollars. Um, Governor Levitt and his wife Jacqueline are back from Washington now, living in St. George. And uh, Governor Levitt is now directing the Michael O. Levitt Center for Politics and Public Service at SUU. This is a nonpartisan, interdisciplinary institution whose goal is to prepare students and to serve, uh, to serve as a responsible and educated leaders in a democratic society. Governor Levitt. Um, has a very interesting quote, which I found on his website, where he stated that public service is a remarkable way to devote oneself, whether it's in politics or in science or art or business or engineering, there's politics and policy involved in all of it. If students can leave with a sense of how to navigate that, they'll be more successful in whatever field they choose. Um, I know that he has uh, some very interesting remarks uh, to deliver this evening on a topic that's of great significance to him and great significance to all of society. And again, I greatly appreciate um, having the opportunity to introduce Governor Michael Levitt. Thank you and good evening. Thank you to the Driggs family for initiating uh, this tradition and what a pleasure it is for me uh, to be the first of the inaugural speaker at this uh, wonderful memorial lecture series. I was, uh, like all of you, a little relieved that they were able to get the microphone working. Uh, I remember such an occasion uh, when Frank Layton, the former coach of the Utah Jazz, uh, when the microphone wouldn't work and they fiddled around with it for a while and they finally got it going and he said, he quipped, I've stood in front of more dead mics than an Irish undertaker. <laughs> it's, it's a line I've always wanted to use and, and tonight was the night. Uh, I, I know many of you would be interested to uh, say hello to Jackie uh, who is here with me and I'd like to ask her to stand so all of you could greet her and see you. I'm also amazed that so many people would come for a discussion on foreign policy when the alternative was dancing with the stars. Uh, there uh, was a significant surprise to me uh, when I became Secretary of Health and Human Services to understand how much time I had to spend outside of the United States in order to protect the health of people inside the United States. 
uh, over the course of the four years that I served in that role and then previously as the leader of the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, I traveled uh, to 38 different countries representing the United States of America. I came to understand the importance of help uh, in our diplomatic toolkit. And tonight I'd like to talk some about my experiences and uh, why I think it's important and some ways I think we can do it better. Uh, I hope at the conclusion of my formal remarks we could have an exchange that's more informal. I'd invite you to begin to think about the things you'd like to talk about, uh, whether they're related to this or otherwise. But I'm delighted to, for, to be here uh, together. Uh, I, I, I want to start by just reflecting on a moment that took place in a back alley of New Delhi. Um, I was holding a little boy across my lap. Uh, I, I am a rather experienced father of five and grandfather of a similar number, so I think I'm well qualified to judge his age at about 18 months. Uh, I tipped his head back and administered a couple of drops of a polio vaccine uh, into his mouth. Uh, the mother, who was a, a very small, quiet woman, I'm guessing in her late 20s, knelt down and took uh, the baby's head in her hands to stabilize the baby. As she did, our eyes met, uh, just for a moment. But there was an unspoken understanding between us that happened almost instantaneously. Uh, parents just want to protect their children. Uh, the circumstances of our lives really couldn't be a lot more different. Um, I was a member of the president's cabinet. I lived in this kind of comfortable townhouse across the Potomac River from the nation's capital. She, on the other hand, uh, lived in a small hut with a dirt floor and a blanket for a door. Our lives only intersected for those few minutes, but as I left India that day, uh, some things had changed. One was her son, who was part of a polio eradication program that the United States participated in, is safer and healthier. The second is that that mother and the people in that neighborhood had a better picture and a clearer view of the compassion of the American people. Now, I had a similar experience in, a, in, in Zanzibar. Uh, I walked into the home of a Muslim father. Uh, it was a hollow concrete block home with a sheet metal roof. Our task for the day was to spray the walls and the roof uh, to kill the mosquitoes that so often brought malaria uh, to their household and to many others. We had that lingering eye contact again for just a second. But in that moment, he conveyed to me uh, 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 the gratitude that any of us have when someone reaches out to our family. I heard HIV uh, AIDS victims in distant villages uh, all over Africa use the words USA with their lips, but with their eyes they were saying thank you. Uh, they knew that their lives were being preserved because of antiretroviral medications that we provide them. I've seen the impressive impact that a big white hospital ship can bring to an entire nation as it pulls into a port. People will arrive hours uh, in advance and line up for blocks hoping that they can leave with a pair of glasses or without a toothache that they came with. Others will get surgery to repair uh, debilitating hernias or the cataracts on their eyes. Tens of thousands of people will come but millions know we're there. Our nation supports economic development. We support clean water projects. We support education. We do it all over the world. We, we hold uh, joint research projects. We train soldiers. We provide we uh, weapons and food and money. But nothing is more powerful than what we do when we minister to people with their health when they're in hardship. Why? Well, my observation is that it's because health is the language of the heart. 
the richest and poorest of us uh, are bound together in the uncertainty of our mortality and the desperation of pain. You give a mother with HIV AIDS hope that she can raise her children and her gratitude will never wane. A heal a father's child and he won't forget. If you give a teenager with disabled or disfigured legs the capacity to be mobile with a wheelchair, he will praise your name forever. As Iraqi Prime Minister uh, Al Al Maliki said to me one day uh, in Baghdad, uh, health is a very good messenger for peace. In geopolitics, there is this constant struggle going on to win the hearts of people in neighborhoods all over the world. In that battle, deeds are more powerful than words. And on the Richter scale of deeds, health makes the needle inside the heart jiggle more vigorously than almost anything else. Because the language of health is the language of the heart. Now there's a lot of talk these days about the use of hard power and soft power. Hard power, of course, is military or economic might. Soft power nudges people in more subtle ways, relying on the accumulation of friendship and trust that's earned. Bob Gates, my colleague in the cabinet, who is the Secretary of Defense, recently told an audience, and I'm going to quote this to be accurate, in short, he said, based on my experience serving seven presidents as the former director of the CIA and now as Secretary of Defense, I am here to make the case for strengthening our capacity to use soft power and for better integrating it with hard power. That's the end of his quote. I hope tonight you'll remember three things of our conversation. The first is that a former Secretary of Health, the Secretary of Soft Power, and the Secretary of Defense, who oversees all of our nation's hard power, had a very strong agreement that hard power and soft power work best when they're integrated. The second thing I hope you'll remember is that health diplomacy is the highest octane soft power generator that we have. And last, I want to make a series of specific recommendations that I hope our current president will hear and the current administration on how we can use soft power more effectively. Now, I suspect the best testimony of, of health diplomacy's real and unique impact is the fact that our enemies use it constantly. Uh, for example, in, in Lebanon, where the legitimate government has tried over and over again but failed to provide adequate health care, Hezbollah, which is a political party that is devoted to terrorism, uh, offers on-the-ground medical clinics and services in poor Shia areas. And they have clinics, they have hospitals, and they have them all over the country. It is in large part the way they have established themselves as a political force in that nation. They know that war alone is not the way you win people, uh, people's trust. In Iraq, uh, Al-Qaeda targeted the health care sector as a means of being able to discredit the legitimate government. I was in Iraq last year. I met with a group of doctors in, from different parts of the country. Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups uh, brutally attacked anyone that was associated with the health care sector, and it worked. Uh, of the estimated 34,000 doctors that were there in the mid-90s, uh, at least 20,000 of them left the country. Since 2003, 8,000 of them quit practicing medicine because of one thing, fear. And it worked. As I suggested, more than 2,200 of them had been killed and kidnapped. And 250 of them were kidnapped just during the last uh, uh, year. It crippled the health institutions in Iraq. It led to corruption. It led to mismanagement. It left the health sector in terrible condition. The availability of health care uh, diminished and people's confidence in the government they were trying to build was diminished. Part of the surge strategy that became a success in Iraq was focusing on the health care sector. I recently met with a group of Iraqi doctors that had come to the United States to spend time learning from the health community. We brought them here to interact with colleagues in their same practice. A month later, they left 
armed with cell phone numbers and email addresses and relationships that will endure, that will provide great value. And they also left with a more positive view of the United States. The Taliban knows the, the importance of, of uh, health diplomacy. They, they methodically targeted clinics. When uh, health workers heard that President Karzai was going to endorse an anti-polio uh, program that we were involved in, he, they asked him not to do it. They said, if the Taliban finds out that the government's involved in this, they're going to attack our clinics and our ability to deliver health care services will be dramatically diminished. I know a man in the health ministry in Afghanistan uh, who had been negotiating with the Taliban for the return of a kidnapped health worker. Uh, to persuade the Taliban uh, leader, who had before that been a, 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 a cleric, my friend appealed to him, uh, trying to use cultural sensitivities. He, he said, look, this is a good man. Uh, he, is, he is not a soldier. He's, he's, he's just trying to help people with their health. He's not trying to, to fight a war. He's not even a government official. The Taliban leader replied, he brings credit to the government, and that's why we want him. That's why we took him. Help legitimizes a government's ideologies. It also legitimizes a terrorist or a revolutionary or a dictator if they're the ones who ultimately provide it. No one understands this better than Fidel Castro. Castro is a master at health diplomacy. He is a master at how to use help to generate soft power. He built a, a series of medical schools that graduates now thousands of health workers, thousands of doctors and nurses every year. The graduates are then deployed into underserved areas and, and underserved nations, poor nations, all over the world. Commonly accepted estimates are that there are some 40,000 Cuban-trained doctors that have been deployed in countries around the world. It's a very clever strategy, really. Cuban doctors become important members of the community. Uh, they become influential political organizers among the poor and the discontent. They give them small sal uh, salaries, and Castro even makes some money on the deal. Uh, in terms of land and population, Cuba is about the size of Pennsylvania. It has an economy that's smaller than West Virginia. But it is a major international player when it comes to health diplomacy. Cuba punches very large, in uh, much bigger than its weight, when it comes to health diplomacy. Doctors schooled in Cuba aren't particularly well trained. In many cases, medical associations complain that they can't pass the exams in the countries where they visit. But they don't, the people who are being served by them don't particularly care. Uh, if you're in Central America or in Africa, and it's replacing nothing, you're glad to have it. I've met Cuban doctors in El Salvador, in Guatemala, in Honduras. I've, seen, I've met them in Nicaragua, in Haiti, Mozambique, Tanzania. When I was in Timbuktu, in Mali, I met a U.S. Special Forces A-team uh, who told me that they had been out among the people in the area where Al-Qaeda trains. And they told me that Cuba ha uh, has uh, permanent workers that are working through that entire area, uh, 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 caring for the people. Recently, I was I had a conversation with a Central American um, health minister who said, we're dependent on Cuba to be able to train our, our doctors. We have no alternative right now. Uh, Hugo Chavez, uh, Chavez of, of Venezuela has begun to adopt the same model. He's currently building a, a series of large medical schools where he intends to deploy doctors just like his friend uh, uh, Fidel Castro has all over the world. Uh, help has become a litmus test in many democracies. And so if you want to undermine a democracy, then you undermine its capacity to deliver essential services that speak to people's heart, that they really care about. And that's what help does. I worry that we're in some serious danger of seeing a reversal of more than 30 years of progress in democracy in the region around in Central America. In country after country, Latin America is beginning to elect leftist governments. Health care is being used by these left-leaning candidates to stir up discontent among the people. The first time I met Hugo Chavez, he said to me, so, what's the infant mortality rate in Washington, D.C.? In Cuba, he said it's six out of a thousand. 
Now, I have no idea if the figures he was quoting are accurate. Frankly, neither did he. Uh, but Chavez wanted to use Washington, D.C. as an example because it was higher overall than the U.S. as a whole, and he was looking for a way to cast the socialist system in the most favorable light. I said to him, uh, and so what is it, Mr. Uh, President in Venezuela? He had to admit it was 23 out of 1,000, but he said he expected it to be lower soon. Uh, let me acknowledge for a minute that there are many uh, people who, who feel that seeking humanitarian and self-interested foreign policy goals in some way is a crass abandonment of, of sincerity. They think that global health ought to be about benevolence. Uh, they feel uncomfortable in measuring the benefit of health diplomacy. Uh, well, I believe we can be benevolent and benefit. In fact, I think it is a practical necessity that we strategically begin to allocate our benevolence in order to optimize the benefit to our country. The benefits of health diplomacy go well beyond just diplomatic points. Health diplomacy is a, uh, benefits the citizens. As I mentioned, inside the United States, I had to go outside in order to keep people inside the United States safe. Examples, infectious disease. In this country, we've had three pandemics in the last hundred years. Uh, we've had ten in the, la er, ten in the last uh, in the last 300 years. The last great pandemic, which incidentally was the mean or the reason that the old Iron County Hospital was built, was the pandemic of 1918. It overran this campus. They had to close the campus in order to put people who were sick in Old Main and other facilities. Uh, it was a earth-changing, geopolitically changing event. Uh, 50 million people across the planet died. The equivalent of 600,000 in this country died. Well, it's in our interest to make certain that if an infectious disease starts somewhere else, that we know it so we can begin to protect and prepare. That's health diplomacy, benefiting them and us. Health diplomacy provides the helps improve the quality of our medicine and our, and our food. Most of the fruits and vegetables now that we eat inside the United States during the winter months are grown in Latin America or in Central America specifically. Uh, and, and when we work with places like Nicaragua, it's not only helping them, it's helping us by keeping our food safer. Let me give you an example. I was in Nicaragua. I, I, I struck up this kind of interesting relationship with uh, President Daniel Ortega. Uh, I, I, over the course of a couple of years, we had many occasions to interact and one day we went out on Lake Managua which is the primary water source uh, for all of Nicaragua. Uh, he got in his Jeep, he was the driver and, uh, and, and I was the passenger. Uh, it was quite an interesting diplomatic moment. Uh, at, but as we drove around working to resolve a problem for him, his water supply, I realized I'm at the same time ensuring that Americans have safe food to eat because if you water fruit with bad, uh, with, with bad water, then you're, likely to have, you're more likely to have disease, diseased fruit or, or, or fruit that can pass disease. Um, but my point here is that we need to begin to look at health diplomacy in a bigger way than just treating patients. We need to take all the things that we do that help people's health across the planet and lump it into a category called health diplomacy. I'm talking about water safety, health security, veterinary care. One of the interesting things I learned is that if you want to draw a crowd in most third world countries, just bring a vet. Because they'll bring their animals and they might let you see the children at the same time. Uh, much bigger than if you just bring a doctor. It's a very interesting phenomenon. We're doing health diplomacy across the, 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 the nature of our, of our government. The State Department renders some, the Department of Defense, the Agriculture, the, the EPA I was with earlier. However, uh, 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 government's activities are really only part of the picture. When you travel outside the United States, as many of you have, you realize that there are thousands of organizations and corporations and universities, private citizens, all rendering health diplomacy from the United States, outside the United States. If you take the combined efforts of the U.S. government and 
and combine it with the non-governmental assistance that comes from the organizations of which I've spoken, the United States is clearly the most powerful or most humanitarianly generous, generous force on, in human history. The problem is, is that there are very few people in the world who believe that. Uh, I am confident that many of those who receive our nation's generosity uh, aren't even aware that it comes from the United States. In other words, we're being benevolent, but we're not getting the benefit. We need to tell the American story in a better way. And as I suggested, I have some suggestions on how to do that. Some American health initiatives are well known, like the AIDS initiative or the malaria initiative I've spoken of earlier. Uh, I believe history is going to demonstrate that President Bush was noble, that he was bold, and he was successful in this category of form, uh, foreign policy. I think it's President Obama's opportunity to make health diplomacy into a central theme of American foreign policy. I believe that President Obama should reach out to the, to the hundreds, maybe thousands, of American non-governmental organizations faith-based organizations, universities, corporations, foundations, and other individuals and he ought, that, that are now doing charitable work outside the United States. And he ought to bring them all together, wrap a great big colorful banner around them, and start showing the world our collective generosity and the compassion of the American people. The president should, be, should, make, should issue a call for all those organizations to begin to express our national, uh, our national compassion as a choir not as a, a collection of soloists. He should ask them all to brand their efforts with a common theme, and that is from the American people. Uh, the phrase from the American people is a phrase that's current, currently being used by the USAID. Uh, the, uh, but can you imagine if the President of the United States uh, or, or if we were to begin seeing the phrase from the American people crop up everywhere around the world. Uh, the most significant deficiency, I believe, in U.S. foreign policy right now is our abysmal job of branding ourselves and our activities. Uh, this is not true just in health alone, but it's, a, it's a, true across the board. Every if, a, agency of the federal government when they go into an area of the world, they like to have their own logo and their own seal on that particular project. Uh, I have routinely seen printed material from the United States that will have six different government logos on the back. Uh, they, they're, they're written in a language people don't understand, and it's confusing. Consequently, people don't know how generous we as a country have been. For very good reasons, a lot of the aid that we provide comes through non-governmental organizations. The federal government will pay for it, they will deliver it. Uh, most of, uh, of these NGOs do an excellent job, but oftentimes the United States, while the largest partner in these, isn't getting any of the credit because people don't know that we're providing it. Uh, nearly every U.S. ambassador I spoke with around the world have, a, have stories where they've gone to meetings with lavish praise being provided to an NGO for support that they've been giving local people. But there's not a hint to the fact that that's being paid for by the American people. There are hundreds of different small things we could do as a country that would begin to drive that brand home. For example, when a patient is handed an antiretroviral uh, uh, dose in a paper bag, it ought to say, from the American people. Uh, when we send community health workers, as we do all through Africa, to go house to house delivering basic health care, uh, they should carry a bag that displays prominently from the American people. If that were done, those sacks and those bags would carry more than medicine. They'd be carrying a message from the American people. Picture, if you can, the President of the United States, President Obama, going to a clinic in Pakistan and helping with the prenatal services that the United States are paying for for mothers in Pakistan. Can you see the, mess the powerful message from the American people? Can you envision a, the president going to, a, a, to El Salvador where they, he would help an American nonprofit be able to immunize children against polio? A powerful message. So in summary, I, I've made three suggestions tonight that I hope the president will undertake. The first is to use health diplomacy to advance our foreign policy objectives in a, in a very strategic way. 
And the second would be to broaden the definition of health diplomacy to include all of the things that we do, including water uh, quality work, uh, health, security, veterinary care, environmental care, all of that should be under the banner and we ought to be unifying, lastly, our brand under the brand from the American people. And it ought not to be just government, it ought to be the entire totality of the aid that's coming from the people of the United States. Uh, in closing uh, my for the formal part of our time together, I'd just like to tell you about an experience that I came to know in, in a quite common way. On many occasions, it was my op uh, uh, opportunity to lead delegations of the United States to countries all over the world. I'd often go to multinational meetings where there would be a square, uh, where people would sit around and they'd have signs for representing each country. And at the beginning of these meetings, there would typically be a, um, an opening statement. And if you've got 25 or 30 or 70 countries sitting around a table and each of them are going to make three minute statements, it can be a very long time. So by the time that you're into the 20th or 30th three minute statement, no one is paying any attention. It's kind of like the legislature, um, uh, President. But I, I, I had been told this would happen, but it was startling to me the first time I experienced it. When it came time for the United States to speak, everything stopped. Everyone listened. It had nothing to do with the fact that Mike Levitt was going to say a word. It was the fact that I sat behind a placard that said the United States of America. Uh, the United States is often vilified. It's sometimes resented. But it is respected as a force for good. And I believe by speaking the learning to use to integrate hard power with soft power, both become more effective. By being, being willing to unify our message as a country and to speak to the hearts of the people of the world, the United States will continue to be the power that it can for good in the world. Thank you. Now, with, with any luck, I'll be able to see you, and I'm told that there may be uh, a microphone going around, and I'd love to just respond to any questions that you might have uh, or respond to any comments that I might have inspired. Randy? I'm going to go into your tenure, but you talked about Asian bird flu, uh, and then it, it didn't seem like you knew much about it. Can you comment on what the dangers are and what, what's the situation now? I can. A good share of my travel internationally, or a portion of it, was to deal with the issue of pandemic influenza. I commented briefly about it. Uh, the import, most important thing to recognize is that pandemics happen. Uh, they are a biologic fact. Uh, they have happened, as I mentioned, three times in the last hundred years, ten times in the last three hundred years, they always rearrange the global landscape when they occur. They occur at distances and times that are far enough apart that we tend to forget. And we aren't prepared. Uh, the world in many respects is more vulnerable to this kind of a rapid traveling, virulent, infectious disease now than it has ever been. Why? Because of the patterns of travel. We know with certainty uh, based on studies that we have done through the Centers for Disease Control that if there is an infectious disease of uh, enough with enough efficiency that it could be considered a pandemic threat if it happens anywhere in the world uh, it will manifest itself within three to six weeks within the United States simply because of the viral nature of infectious diseases and the patterns of world travel so it is important that we are on guard always for a pandemic and we are underprepared. So a good share of my responsibility was not just to prepare the United States, but was to say to other countries, we have to be partners here because if there is an infectious disease anywhere, there is danger everywhere. 
Now the virus that everyone is concerned about right now is the H5N1 virus, often referred to as the avian influenza. Uh, it continues to spread. It is virtually ubiquitous among birds. Uh, it periodically crops up among humans. It is highly deadly when it occurs. We've now uh, ha approaching 400 deaths. More than 60% of those who get it die. But in order for a, a disease to become pandemic in nature, it has to be both virulent, that is to say strong enough to kill a person, and efficient, that is to say it was spreads rapidly. This is clearly virulent, but it is not efficient. And we don't see any pattern at this moment that the virus is mutating toward efficiency. Does that mean it won't? Are we in 1916 uh, equivalent, or are we not going to see this one mature? I, I don't know. But if it's not that one, it will be another because pandemics happen. And so I, my, my answer to you is I don't see any immediate danger from this particular virus, but the big danger is that we would be lulled into a lack of, uh, to a lull of, uh, a lack of preparation. I'll tell you just, uh, I went to all 50 states, uh, in addition to many, many countries, uh, urging states to organize pandemic influenza plans, organizing for them to have everyone to have a plan, not just for pandemic influenza, but for any kind of natural or man-made disaster that could disrupt society. And it can happen quickly now because of just-in-time supply chains. I was in the state of Wyoming, and I, a reporter said to me, we've heard you say you need to have a supply of food. That's expensive. How do you expect the common person to have a supply of food? Calling upon some of my uh, Cedar City training, I said, um, oh, it's not so hard. When you go to the grocery store, if you're going to buy some tuna fish, instead of getting four cans, get five and put one under the bed. If you're going to get a gallon of milk, get a gallon of powdered milk and put it under the bed. I thought it was very good advice. So did Jay Leno. Uh, a couple of days later, he said, Hey, did you hear about this pandemic plan that Secretary Levitt has? He says you ought to put tuna fish and powdered milk underneath your bed. He said, tuna fish and powdered milk? I'd rather have the flu. Uh, then a couple of days later, he said, Hey, did you hear about this pandemic plan? Tuna fish, powdered milk, uh, under the bed. He said, tuna fish and powdered milk. He said, if that's Levitt's version of a pandemic plan, you can just star kiss your rear end goodbye. <laughs> then a couple of days after that, he said, uh, tuna fish and powdered milk. He said, isn't, isn't that what they call clam chowder at Red Lobster? <laughs> now, very clever, but it got the word out. Very, it was the most effective thing I, I did during that entire uh, crusade. Let's go to another question. Governor Levin, I, I appreciate very much what you've said about the role of the U.S. government and also NGOs with regard to exercising soft power. What about private foundations like the Gates Foundation or even an any like Rotary International and their commitment to polio eradication? What, what role do these uh, private entities and their, their foundations have? Uh, thank you, President. Th those are exactly the kinds of efforts that I believe the new president ought to incorporate in an overall branding strategy to brand very clearly the United States synonymous with our willingness to reach out and help people with their health. Uh, the Gates Foundation is a remarkably well-organized and powerful force in world health. They are skillful at being able to take dollars that have been earned through the private sector and to match them with governments or to supplement governments and to partner with people. The same thing is true with, with, uh, with Rotary International, uh, with their polio. We are on the verge of eradicating po polio off the face of the planet. Uh, we got very close and then it starts to crop up. But we go into these, I told you a little bit about this thing in, uh, in India, but uh, they will organize over the course of several days using uh, local rotaries and governments and other, th other things. So sometimes they'll administer a million doses of, of polio vaccine in a particular 
metropolitan uh, area in, in, in a single uh, week. It's a very inspiring effort. And it's my view that the president, that President Obama, has an opportunity to capture some of those with universities and others and say to them, join with us and let's demonstrate that this is not just the U.S. government, that this is the American people, that the American people are compassionate people who want to reach out. And I will tell you of the things I learned during secretary, my time as Secretary of Health, that's the number one thing. It is the compassion of the American people. I saw it over and over again. I saw it through seven weeks of traveling in the Gulf region after Katrina. I saw people open their homes. I saw after their, their ch open their church basements. I saw them open their arms and welcome people in. I saw it during the time we rolled out the Medicare prescription drug benefit. Uh, I mean, tens of thousands of organizations uh, in a network of caring reaching out to their neighbors. That could have never happened if it were government alone. The American people are a remarkably compassionate group. Uh, and we don't get the credit for it. And I believe this is an opportunity for President Obama uh, to share it with the world and change the perception that sometimes the world have, has of us of simply a purveyor of hard power. I'll let the... Mike. Thank you. Um, I had the opportunity to spend a great deal of time in humanitarian airlift, and I'd like to hear your comments on the effectiveness and the approach that our military is using. My impression is that we have a lot of people who are doing a really good job out there, and nobody ever hears about it. Uh, that's a, uh, that is my perception as well. Um, I mentioned the uh, Special Forces A teams that were in the northern Africa and Mali. Uh, they've been out on a six week uh, combining rec reconnaissance with health care. I mean, it's, it's evident that if you can bring people in and demonstrate you care about them, that they're going to trust you and they're going to begin to talk with you and you can begin to be more effective in your military mission. Southcom, which is what handles our South American uh, uh, military operations, is a big force in health care. Uh, in Nicaragua, uh, one uh, one month they provided dental care to, uh, as I recall, almost 40,000 people. I mentioned the hospital ships, uh, the U.S. NS Comfort and Mercy. Uh, when they pull into a port, they'll, they'll serve tens of thousands of people, and millions know they are there. In Iraq, uh, I was in Iraq a couple of uh, months ago and, and, and saw, uh, this was quite poignant to me, frankly, uh, in a military hospital, uh, two, two patients, one a little boy, a local boy who had been bitten by a snake, had been brought into a, probably saved his life. I walked through an operating theater and saw a, 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 a scene I won't, I won't take, I won't uh, describe because it was horrific in the terms of the medical, to, to a person who's not accustomed to that, to seeing uh, the impact of a uh, of an IUD that had exploded, and I asked about the patient. I said, well, he's Iraqi. He was setting the bomb. Um, it went off. But we took him in, and we did our best to put him back together. Um, the military mission right now in Iraq is largely focused on being able to help the health care providers. Why? Because it's part of the surge operation. We can move into neighborhoods. We can help provide military assistance to health care, we become, they become, they, be, be, they begin to trust us and, and we earn their trust and at that point they begin to say, I can trust you, there is a person over here that I'm concerned about and we can, we can then begin to deal with that. So I think the military is doing a remarkable job and it's the reason that Bob Gates said what he did. It makes us more, uh, it, it, it makes us stronger as a military to integrate our hard power with our soft power, to demonstrate our compassion and our might. Uh, that's the key. I would like to ask a question that has a little more local um, concern for me. I've been an emergency room nurse for the last three years, and one of the things that I've been most concerned about or aware about is uh, I noticed in the emergency room from government regulations like uh, the JACO regulations we can't charge for 
all the visits that we receive, patients that we receive in the emergency room, and also even with Medicaid and Medicare reimbursement, it seems like even primary care doctors are going out of business and emergency rooms are going out of business because they can't get reimbursed for the services they provide. What kind of things uh, do you think could happen or should happen to uh, address those? Uh, well, the main thing is we need to start using emergency rooms for emergencies and not for clinical care and primary care. And in many places all over the country, people know that if they don't have insurance, they can show up at an emergency room and be treated because that's the way we've written our law and that somebody else, namely the federal government or those that are insured, will pay the bill. Uh, so the main solution is let's find a way to get every American access to an affordable basic insurance policy and begin to turn our emergency rooms into emergency rooms and not clinics. Uh, we, another thing I would suggest to you is that uh, we are, are, the way we compensate uh, emergency care, or primary care I should say, is making it far more difficult for a primary care physician to make uh, a living. And we are reimbursing specialists at a much higher rate and consequently doctors are smart people and they know that if you want to make a living you don't become a primary care doctor you become a specialist because you can make a lot more we've got to invert that and begin to reward keeping people healthy as opposed to just healing them after they get or dealing with them after they're sick which is a, a different subject and one I'm primed to break into song any moment on uh, but I'll leave it at that Uh, your idea to brand our benevolent initiatives with from the American people is uh, very intriguing and I can see the potential for tremendous goodwill tangible and intangible abroad and as the American citizens providing that it could uh, really raise morale for the citizenry do you see that branding extending to our NEA initiatives that is all of the art that we send abroad uh, yes I, I do um, now let me just make two comments um, maybe three um, the, the first is that we are a very generous people and we help not just in health but many other areas my own view is because health is such a powerful universal language you can't be known for everything in the world and you can't provide an unlimited amount of everything in the world and particularly in times when our own resources are being demanded we need to begin to focus on building a brand and a reputation and my own view is that while it would be valuable to brand those other things we ought to work hard to become known as the compassionate providers of health and and being able to uh, focus on the health branding is, in, in, in my mind, uh, extraordinarily important. Uh, can I just, uh, the second thing I want to mention is that I'm, I'm, I talked about NGOs and at, at times we do business with NGOs and we deliver through them and it troubles me that sometimes they don't tell the people that we're providing care for that it's the Americans paying for it. I do want to acknowledge that there are times when that's a bad idea that it endangers the lives of those who are delivering uh, the care and we'd have to you obviously need to have room to to to, uh, to to deal to deal with that and I had a third thing but I can't think of what it was right now it'll come to me and I'll interrupt you and tell you uh, governor we served as a NGOs in Asia and uh, I would like to uh, support the second point that you made that it is difficult <clears throat> for NGOs to uh, say this came from the American people uh, we found we could partner with the Catholic Church we could partner with UNICEF we had a very close association with the US embassies it, throughout Asia but we didn't get very much help or support from the uh, US embassies other than in terms of protection um, there were 17 NGOs that were killed in Sri Lanka in 2007. It is dangerous um, work, especially when a civil war is going on. Um, 
Also, I'm not quite as uh, sanguine as you are about the cure of polio. Um, 1.1 billion people in uh, India. You uh, land at the airport. You're inundated by a, a mob of beggars, almost all of them having suffered from polio. Uh, Sri Lanka, you have to have a polio booster shot before you can even land in the country. Uh, many of those Asian countries, it costs about $1,800 for immunization just to uh, come into the country. But we found it was very difficult as an NGO to partner and say from the American people. It was all right to put LDS charities on 680 boats that we gave to victims of the tsunami or a school that was built. But I don't, I'm not sure the LDS Church would uh, be willing to put from the American people. Uh, there are many organizations where that wouldn't likely be appropriate. Rotary may be one because they're an international organization. Obviously the LDS Church is an international organization. They have a different view. But there are many that that is not the case on. Uh, if I gave you any um, sense of being sanguine about polio, I'd, I need to recalibrate. But we're, it's doable. I think they had 300 and some odd cases of polio in India last year. Uh, anytime you're dealing with um, a population that is nearing a billion people, where there are no records in many cases of children and their ages, and where you have to go literally house to house, it's a tough grind. But, but, they're, but we're within reach of doing it. Uh, let me just mention that I, I think you're obviously very experienced with this. and. Uh, and I concur with much of what you have said. I suspect you would concur with me that in many theaters uh, it can be done. And in many cases uh, it, it, where it isn't, it ought to be. And uh, there's it, it not a single answer to all of this, except it's important that people do know Americans are compassionate and, and, we, and, and it aids us all in many, many different ways. Good comments, thank you. And thank you for your service, by the way. I will tell you that I have encountered the most humanitarianly um, wonderful people uh, who go into settings that are uncomfortable, dirty, disease-ridden, and dangerous uh, because they want to make the, a difference in the lives of other people. Uh, that's why this is such a universal language. and. Um, why I think the United States ought to capture that, that brand to the extent that we can and let people know that we're helping in every way possible. This is a tough problem, uh, that time won't allow tonight, but balancing uh, our expenditures as a nation on where, how, how much you put into this kind of thing, uh, when you begin to meet needs like HIV AIDS, uh, you almost begin to create a, a dependency and an entitlement uh, that is dangerous because you can't ever stop. And so a lot of what we need to focus on is how we can build infrastructure that will allow them to uh, help themselves. Who's got a microphone? Okay, go ahead. Uh, I, you're talking about branding that called the food, or not food, but clothing and blankets and health care stuff to a receiving country. In order to do that, you had to uh, put him out. It had their brand. Uh, well, it, it's um, like the international community. Those of you who've worked in here know how imperfect it is. <laughs> And there are lots of things that happen that you wish would or would happen differently. Uh, you know, there are many governments in the world who will hold things at ports waiting for a bribe. And if they don't get it, uh, it'll just sit there. And people will either go hungry or untreated. Uh, that, that's hard from a humanitarian standpoint to, to, to figure why they would do that, but they, but they do. Uh, there are governments that will take supplies we send to them and that's one of the reasons we use NGOs so much because if it's government to government many times the, the they will they will they're more uh, quick to um, 
uh, to deploy it improperly. Uh, so this is a very complicated uh, area, and and when you and, and each case has to be dealt with 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 differently. Yes. My question is um, maybe not as sharp as it needs to be, but you've uh, emphasized how important health care and and uh, helping people prevent disease can be, but. One of the things that I think maybe has to be addressed simultaneously is they have to be well fed because at least 80% of the disease in the world is probably preventable if there's adequate nutrition. And a lot of people who are getting AIDS, if they could grow their own food, wouldn't be leaving home and then bringing back more than money. They're bringing back a, a life-threatening disease not only for themselves but their family. And I don't think we should just separate the fact that we're going to have to teach people to feed themselves as well as teach people how to take care of their health. Well, this is a great point on which to examine the complexity of how we prioritize. Um, here's the reality. The world is a very large place. All of you know that. There are billions of people, and most of them have very serious needs. Those of you who have traveled over the world know that that most of the world doesn't look like um, the United States. Uh, it's, you know, most of the world lives in a very poor, underfed, underserved area, and there are, there's unlimited needs that, w that we all respond to. And so it does boil down to a question of what is the role of the United States and how far can we go? And that's the reason I wanted to make the point that uh, in order for us to justify being in this business at all, beyond the humanitarian importance of it, there needs to be a, a reason that we would take a dollar from a domestic health program and put it into a, an African program or a Central American program. And so there has to be a benefit that comes to the United States where we can both be, we, we, can, we can both have, we can be benevolent and benefit because we'll never have enough money to do everything, either internationally or domestically. And uh, there's lots of discussion and debate about which is the most important, food or health care. They're all important. And, it, and it's a wonderful thing that people reach out in the spirit of humanitarianism and do what they can to help those who, who can. In my view, that's what the United States has to do. We have to help those that we can. One of the most difficult decisions I ever participated in was to decide which 15 countries we would help on HIV, AIDS, and, and malaria. It isn't like AIDS doesn't exist in, any, in all other countries, that, and it isn't like people who don't suffer, but we had a limited amount of money, $15 billion, which is the largest uh, the largest commitment that we that anyone has ever made on a single disease and it still was just a drop in the bucket by comparison to what the long-term need was and so this really does boil down to a question of how much can we afford how can we deploy it most efficiently and how can we assure that we're optimizing the benefit so that we're both benevolent in our spirit and benefiting in terms of our foreign policy um, I, I, I welcome your, your comment because uh, I know how desperately important food is, and it's a wonderful way to highlight how do we see uh, unmet met need that uh, we don't have the capacity to meet and, and cope with it. It's a, hard, it's a hard problem. I think we've got time for one or maybe two more, and we'll... Who's got the microphone? Uh, I just want to comment on your comments on uh, basically... Um with the, food, the health programs for other countries. I mean, it, logically it sounds an excellent idea. It makes them trust in us, makes them a little more believable in our policies. Um, but how do we force, I, I don't want to say force, but how do we get the nations to accept the help? Because I know in Somalia they had problems with trying to give them food. We, they had problems trying to give them care. Um, we can't exactly force them to accept the help, though, either. I mean, what are your suggestions on, on how to combat that? Uh, I conducted negotiated discussions with the Chinese government on behalf of our government, tried to intercede with another country 
who wouldn't allow us to go in and provide aid after a terrible natural disaster. Uh, the Chinese, who were good friends of this country, uh, said, look, it's, we think they ought to have aid too, but it's not, not the nature of our relationship with them to try to tell them what to do. If their friends can't tell them what to do, then we're in a place where we, by going in to try it, we almost, almost make things worse. And, you know, it's hard to imagine. It's really hard to imagine how you could be the leader of a country that's been ravaged by a, a, a tsunami or ravaged by some form of earthquake or some terrible storm and having people starving and hurt and having people offering aid and be unwilling to have them because of political purposes or p political reasons. It's hard to fathom that, but it happens. And it falls into the category of we, we, we're not able to do everything uh, for everyone, sometimes because of logistic reasons, sometimes because of silly uh, political reasons, and sometimes because of corruption, and sometimes we just run out of money. So I think we have to boil it down to we do what we can, we do it the best we can, we try to maintain a benevolent spirit as a country, and we try to make certain that we're leveraging our benevolence to get the maximum level of benefit possible. I will continue to have an internal debate as to how much we can afford and whether or not we're deploying it in the right way. But in my mind, the most important thing is that we are strategically doing it, that we are doing it, and that we're doing the best we can to, to, to benefit from it. So we have one more. Welcome home. Thank you. Just a couple. I mean, Simone and I were in, on a small island in the mouth of the Fly River in Daru, was Daru in New Guinea. And uh, the first thing I noticed was all these young men wearing shirts that before and UCLA 21. And they were scattered here and there, not a lot, but a few. I knew where they came from. They didn't. them for them and this is what but that's just to, to validate this name thing I think we need to do that but the people there where, where those things came from my question is if we're going to provide health care for everyone who has need and I understand there's many 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 who go without proper health care where are we going to get the health care professionals are we pre preparing to uh, provide the education necessary to meet that demand? Are you uh, thinking about our country or around the world? Our, co our country and abroad, too. Well, I'll just comment briefly on our country. Uh, I think medical education in our country uh, it has to be at the top of the list of reform, not because the education is not high quality. It is. Not because it's they're not capable, but the model uh, doesn't turn out enough people uh, to meet the demand. You could take the number of nurses, nursing schools in our country and double it or triple it and run them 24 hours a day and they still wouldn't turn out the, enough nurses in many cases to meet the demand. Uh, and we need to, in, in my mind, uh, change that model to begin to employ a lot of the resources we have in hospitals and clinics and begin to change the model of how we, how we conduct basic education. Let me comment on it internationally. There is no one single theme throughout the healthcare world that is more common than the need for skilled medical workers. Uh, I was in, uh, on pandemic, uh, Randy, I was in Central America attending a meeting of uh, Central American health ministers. And after we concluded our discussion about um, health, um, about pandemic influenza and preparation, um, they began to talk about how can we meet the shortage of people who are birth attendants. I mean, they, have, they, they will lose one out of ten mothers in birth in some areas because they lack attendants who have the basic skills to handle any level of complication. And uh, as they talked, they began to talk about the development of some kind of regional facility. And afterward, I said to several of them at lunch, um, I, 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 this appears to me to be a need where the United States might be helpful. Uh, what if we were to develop a school 
uh, in Panama, for example, that's where we were, uh, where uh, students from all over the Central American region could come and be trained not to be doctors or nurses, but to be skilled medical workers. And um, they were quite enthusiastic about this. They came to Washington later for a meeting, and we met again. And over the course of about a year and a half, that vision came to pass. And there is today uh, in Panama a school that will take school, uh, classes of students from all over Central America who come to uh, Panama. They get a good uh, thir 12 to f uh, sometimes 7 to 15 week course on basic things like birth attendant or uh, here's an interesting one medical equipment repair uh, they get people donating medical equipment but no one knows how to fix it and they were I went around to meet with all of the various countries and they said can you get us somebody who can repair this equipment uh, so uh, we have this school going now. I think that's a model we ought to be replicating all over the world because people are so hungry and so appreciative. And when the students go and they get a little introduction to, uh, under the American flag, to a, the, a taste of freedom and democracy at the same time they get their skills training, it, it, it helps the cause of, of freedom as well as the humanitarian need that's so desperately there. Well, it's, a, it's, it's been a delight to... Um, spend this part of the evening with you. Uh, let me just say again, I've come away from this experience understanding better what a great place it is, uh, uh, in, in, uh, how great it is to live in southern Utah. Uh, we're, we're blessed beyond measure. I'm just curious, could I ask by raise of hand, how many of you at one time or another have conducted some kind of, of uh, health or other humanitarian service in a foreign country. I, I think that is, um, I, I would estimate that it was 40% of the audience. Um, I, I would suggest that is a, a testament to the goodness and the compassion of the American people. And my message in closing is that uh, we are a great country, we're a blessed country, and we're made, only made greater uh, by the extension of our benevolence but it's our responsibility to our country to make certain we also benefit. Thank you. Thank you Please drive safely.